Thanks. Um, let me call upon Samson Pagati from EWT. Please come forward. Thank you. And he's on page 117 from our pack. Where do I press? Where do I move to the next slide? Just, yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today I'm talking about the issue of uh, dog hunting. But I think it's very, very important that uh, you know I, I emphasize this point because uh, you know the general public, whenever you talk about uh, the issue of uh, hunting or dog hunting, we tend to make a mistake of uh, painting the hunters and the poachers with the same brush, which is not the case at all. Because these two are completely different. For example, if you talk about a poacher, it's someone who trespasses on a private land in order to hunt or catch game illegally. And in most cases, they have no vested interest in conservation. No passion for outdoors. And of course, no vision for sustainable utilization of natural resources because, I mean, they destroy whatever they come across. No regard for the law. But when you talk about hunters, or maybe a hunter, I mean, it's someone who can contribute to conservation. Because if you talk about a hunter, obviously it's someone who practices hunting within the parameters of the law. So they will have respect for law. More importantly, they will have that knowledge of the law, respect for the animal, its habits, and of course the whole intention being that of killing an animal in a, in a clean and quick way. And ladies and gentlemen, I thought it's important for me to share this because whenever you are trying to address sensitive environmental issues, it is critically important to understand in terms of what are you dealing with. Now, we are talking about people who use poaching, I mean, who obviously do poaching, using dogs to run down an animal. The question that we always have to ask ourselves, would these people have a permit to do such activities? In most cases, no. Will they have a permit to enter into someone's property? No. So therefore, automatically, you can say that we are dealing with poachers in this instance. And of course, another thing as community engagement facilitators, it's unlike the issue of rhino poaching, where sometimes you might not know the individuals that are involved. But when it comes to dog hunting, it's people that we know also people that are members of our communities and also people who see the issue of dog hunting as an authentic cultural practice since it has been practiced for many years. And of course it's people you know who are well organized you know in terms of planning these hunts, in terms of where to hunt, how many, how many dogs to involve in such hunt. Is the patrol system effective in that area and all of those uh, issues. And of course, these days there's a strong element of gambling. A lot of money involved. Talking about something uh, as high as uh, 30,000 rand for a dog that is able to bring an animal down. And I must also emphasize, again, talking about the issue of dog hunting is not an issue that can be associated with black people alone. It cuts across all racial lines because we also talk about the grey horn breeders, of which some of them are also hunters as well. And now the question is, why do we have to concern ourselves with this issue? Working for the Trillium Grassland Species Program, the Oribe antelope is one of our focus species. Some of you would know that the Oribe antelope is one of the most endangered antelope in South Africa. I'm not sure how many rhinos do we have left in South Africa because the population kind of changes all the time. 
due to poaching and all those things. But with runners, with Orebi, we are sitting with less than 2,000 animals. That's a serious situation. <clears throat> and out of this, uh, from this uh, 2011 Orebi survey or Orebi count, these less than 2,000 animals were made out of uh, from 166 groups, so families. 142 of those families were highly threatened due to poaching with the use of dogs. And then overall PA and an overall picture, 73 percent of the threats to Orebi were attributed to the use of dog hunting, poaching practices. And we know that a sizable number of Orebi in South Africa are lost due to dog hunting. So many cases are not reported. We do have a law enforcement uh, uh, structure in this country, but it cannot simply go to each and every situation. The question is, why are Oribe an easy target? They are less shy animals, driving around the road, or even the farm, you could easily see them grazing. Unlike under and under other antelopes who will try to hide when you approach. And when chased by dogs, in most cases they are not able to go through fences or over fences. So they will just uh, run straight to a fence and in the process get killed. And of course they are curious animals. They have this habit of running when chased by dogs and stop and glance at the back and run again. In a process, it gives uh, dogs an opportunity to to catch up. So, just to conclude, in concluding this point, the Oribe are basically antelopes, which are in a trap, when which are trapped, you know, in an area where they are at. Therefore, it makes it easy for dogs to catch them. So they are valuable to dog hunting. <laughs> and of course my perspectives, engaging in this, I knew from the start that it was going to be a daunting task. You know when we called our first uh, stakeholder meeting, there was an overwhelming interest. But after that it soon faded because people realized that, you know, this can be, you know, a difficult task. And especially when you get to a situation where you don't know what to do, you have to rely on law enforcement. But you know, really, in most cases, it's not effective. And we know that uh, hunting with dogs is an Asian sport. And I always say this all the time. I don't think it will go away. I remember growing up in Pumalanga. The farming community within Pumalanga are well organized in terms of patrols and all of that. So therefore, they used to shoot dogs and also shoot at people and all of that. But did it stop hunting? Not at all. So we have to accept that the issue is going to be there, but we have to try and find ways of uh, limiting the impact on species. And of course, it's an emotional and sensitive issue. I know whenever I give a talk, we just see the number of questions that people ask. And of course, as I said, that when we started, so many people came forward and there were there was a lot of enthusiasm. But down the line, people started going their separate ways. And uh, I mean, the pictures are telling the story that this hunting has got a devastating effect on what life. Antelope, and you think about a whole lot of things which also get killed, like your, your small animals or so, and they let left on the field. And then we also know that uh, those dogs that are involved in the hunting itself, some of them are very expensive those crayons, and they are specifically bred for that uh, purpose. So losing a dog uh, for a hunter, you know, has really financial implication. So not only from, not only uh, for the uh, landowner or the area to be targeted, also, 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 also from the hunters as well. And I think, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to share this perspective. I didn't support all the details, but a million research was conducted uh, around a uh, uh, fry head, which uh, included about 12 properties or 12 farmers. The whole idea was to kind of farm 
try to weigh the, the impact of dog hunting on uh, livestock as well as uh, uh, game. And you know, it came up to just almost 110,000 rand that they were losing per year. So therefore, this issue has got financial implications for the farmers and also the hunters and themselves themselves. We always ask ourselves then, what can we do? Is law enforcement an answer? In some cases, yes. And in some cases, no. It cannot stand alone. I honestly believe that, especially as conservation organization, we have law enforcement. We also have got a, a side of our work where we deal with communities, either through community engagement or environmental education. But at the end of the day, you must be able to marry these two because you cannot have a, you cannot afford to have a situation where your law enforcement officers are seen as enemies from the communities. You know, hence you as a community engagement facilitator, you are seen as a, a good person, partly because maybe you're not prepared to discuss these issues. We know that uh, when it comes to communities, we all want to have good working relationships. Sometimes it means neg neglecting some of these issues, which is a sad thing. So having said that, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> I honestly believe that uh, you know there are some issues where down the line you need to reach a compromise position. And I think this is one issue where it is certainly not going to go away. So we, def we definitely need to try and uh, like explore other op possibilities or alternatives, if I can put it that way. And I honestly believe that as we are sitting around this room, I mean, we all have our own ideas in terms of what we think uh, needs to be done and all of that. And that's the reason why I don't want to share more in terms of what has been done and what can be done. Because I only believe that up until the time where we can be able to engage the hunters themselves and understand from them in terms of why do they think it's a way forward? Because so many of them are, are they really concerned. They are losing the animals. Every time they have to go and hunt, they always have to die and die, all of that. So certainly, if there can be a means of sitting down, surely there should be an alternative, of which something that has been put forward is the issue of, uh, like, uh, I mean, the, is this dog racing as an alternative. But of course, there's an issue of husbandry in that as some organizations are not happy, and especially in terms of how the animals will be treated and all of that. But then at the end of the day, one has to actually try and work out something. Because otherwise, unless we do that, uh, in five or ten years' time, we might not have enough already left. If you think about the 2,000 that we have. I hope I haven't gone over time. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Yes, this brings us to a normal timing. Thank you for finishing a bit earlier. Ladies and gentlemen, less than 2,000 of our oribis uh, in South Africa.